So, welcome to worship. Uh, I invite you to pause, to breathe. Take a moment to pay attention to your breath. How fast or how slow? How deep or how shallow? Fill your lungs and feel them fill with air and release. Maybe you breathe in and direct your breath to areas in your body where you may feel tension, where you may notice those things or notice discomfort. Maybe you exhale and give permission for the tension, the pain to leave. Maybe if you feel like it on your next intake of breath, you allow yourself to fill with light. And maybe that light is love to you. Maybe it's comfort, inspiration. Maybe it is God or Christ. Maybe you just welcome life to fill you in and out, expanding and releasing. Breathing together. Trusting in God's goodness wherever we find ourselves in this moment. I invite you to imagine, to remember, to consider that we are not alone. And not only does the holy walk with us, maybe we remember that other people have walked these paths, paddled these waters, cultivated fields, harvested medicines, told stories, and sang songs, hunted, fished, raised families, built shelters and homes for generations. And like us, they knew joy and sorrow. They understood what it felt like to be part of something greater than themselves, and they knew isolation and separation where ancient feet have walked upon the earth, we walk, where people have built friendships and relationships with the land, we cultivate relationships with our neighbors and the land, wherever we are. Breathing and dreaming, praying, hearts full or in need of filling, we acknowledge the first peoples who are our neighbors. And we join together here in Kitimat we give thanks for our Heisland Nation sisters and brothers. We acknowledge the traditional unceded territory of the Heisland Nation. And together we say, we give thanks knowing that before this church building was here, there was a united church already in the Heisland village, connected to the, the wider, wider church, church. Thanks, Thanks to the to ministry, the ministry of, of the Thomas, Thomas Crosby, Crosby Mission. Ship. It was the people and the ministers in the village that at that time helped to plant the first seeds of this community of faith in 1953 as a company town was being born in the valley. We breathe, we breathe in, in our, our collective, collective history, history acknowledging, acknowledging need for healing and, and reconciliation. reconciliation. Trusting, trusting in, in the, the transformative, transformative power of God's love and the, and the audacious, audacious tenacity, tenacity of, of the Holy, Holy Spirit. Spirit. In our healing, we live into right relationship. As, As we, we heal, heal, we, we love, love right, right relationship, relationship into, into being, being by the power of the Holy Spirit. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Amen. Amen. The center of our community is, is Christ. Christ. Our healing is, is Christ. Christ. Our light is, is Christ. Christ. Our path is, is Christ. Christ. Thanks be to God. Amen. Amen. All right, do we remember this? Split into two. You're the hallelujah part. You're the praise ye the Lord part. Are you ready? Hallelujah, 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 praise you the Lord. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah praise you the Lord. Praise you the Lord. Hallelujah, praise you the Lord. Hallelujah, praise you the Lord. Hallelujah.
There's your calisthenics for the morning. <laughs> Let's pray, source of love and life. You introduce us to your holiness and your own and our own sacred hearts a little bit at a time. As we give you praise, you know that too much, too much light, too much love, too much energy, too soon without practice and preparation can overwhelm us. Overwhelming beauty can take away our breath. Overwhelming gratitude can bring us to tears. Our cups overflow. Overwhelming love can break our hearts open, expanding our capacity to even greater love. Overwhelming grace can bring us to our knees. In your presence, we are powerless. In your presence, in our lives, your presence in our lives makes us more powerful than we dare imagine loving God. Be present to us in this service, real, invigorating, motivating, affirming, and healing. You are our God, and we are your people. May we live and love as if we believe this to be true. Amen. Amen. This is your time. Time to be in the presence of God. And sometimes we have practices through the week that we do. Spiritual practices of prayer, or journaling, art, going for walks and talking with God. But sometimes our weeks get so busy and life happens, we forget. We forget those practices that bring us closer to God. So this moment... This moment is your moment. Let's pray. Holy One, into the silence, we lift up our places where we need you, however that is, whatever that would look like. We just open ourselves to you.
Holy One, we trust that you receive those prayers that are too deep for words. Hear the good news. Nothing that we can do or say, nothing we can choose or not to do or not to say makes us any less worthy of God's loving, liberating grace. Every Every day day we we have have another another opportunity to to choose love. Every Every day day we have have another opportunity to choose life. Every day God says, I I choose choose you even Even when when you forget forget to choose choose me. Christ says, I I love love you, you, even even when when you forget forget to love me or love love yourself. For God's amazing grace, we We give give our thanks thanks and praise. praise. Amen. Feels a little quieter today. Some folks are awake as a family day weekend, the stat holiday. And uh, maybe we're feeling a little tired. It's that middle of the winter kind of, when is spring coming? Mm. How many people here need the peace of Christ? How many folks out there do we think need the peace of Christ? All of them. (laughs) So we take all that love. We take all that goodness and light. Not only do we share it with each other, we share it with the folks out there. So look around. May the peace of Christ be with you all. And And also also with with you. you. Amen. We listen for God's living word. And the word, our first reading today can be found in the Hebrew Testament's book of Exodus, chapter 24, verses 12 to 18. Let our hearts be open as we listen for God's wisdom. God said to Moses, come up to me on the mountain and wait there, and I will give you the tablets of stone with the law and the commandments, which I have written for their instruction. So Moses set out with his assistant Joshua, and Moses went up into the mountain of God. To the elders he had said, Wait here for us until we come to you again, for Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute may go to them. Then Moses went up on the mountain, and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of God settled on Mount Sinai and the mountain covered it for six days. On the seventh day, God called to Moses out of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of God was like a devouring fire on the top of the mountain in sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain. 
Moses was on the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights. For the sacred wisdom passed down to us through our spiritual ancestors. Thanks be to God. Be to God. Amen. Amen. So this is a song I wrote more years ago than I care to remember. <clears throat> but I was living in the Caribou when I wrote it, so I had to make friends with country music. So if you want to sing this with a bit of a country-esque twang, you're welcome to do so. We've sung it here before, so. The free folk stood under God's mountain. T'was rumbling and smoking and bright. They trembled with fear and devotion. While Moses stood firm in God's sight, and down from the mountaintop's glory, the sound of God's trumpet was heard, along with the rules God had given them to use to help them to avoid the blues. Like, believe I've only one God, and that's me. Don't make any images, please. I'm too many places with too many faces. It's too hard to copy the breeze. And don't use my name like a flame that burns hearts and causes deep pain. I am who I am, and I'll be who I'll be. My name is the presence of love. Then God took a breath, barely stopping, commanding the people to rest. Take one day a week, make it holy. The other six days do your best. Do honor the people who raised you. They brought you up to walk my earth. They may not be perfect, but neither are you. They've loved you for better, for worse. You shall not take life out of vengeance. Please cherish all life that I give. Don't think of another or act like a lover with someone without whom you live. Don't steal and don't borrow forever. Don't give what is not yours to take. In justice be true, give your never fair due. Friendship a lie does not make. I say don't long to be like the pharaohs. Be happy with what you have got. The grass may seem greener, but your life is sweeter. Love who you are, thanks to God. Then God took a breath, finally stopping. That the people asked Moses to talk. Do not be afraid, for God loves you always. Remember the commandments just taught. Like love, only one God, and that's me. Don't make any images, please. I'm too many places with too many faces. It's too hard to copy the breeze. And don't use my name like a flame that burns hearts and causes deep pain. I am what I am, and I'll be who I'll be. My name is the presence of love. And the word continues. Our second reading on this Transfiguration Sunday can be found in the Christian Testament's Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 17, verses 1 to 9. Six days later, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and his brother John and led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, and his clothes became dazzling white. Suddenly there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. Then Peter said to Jesus, 
Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three dwellings here, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, suddenly a bright cloud overshadowed them, and from the cloud a voice said, This is my son, the beloved. With him I am well pleased. Listen to him. Then when the disciples heard this, they fell to the ground and were overcome by fear. But Jesus came and touched them, saying, Get up and do not be afraid. And when they looked up, they saw no one except Jesus himself alone. As they were coming down the mountain, Jesus ordered them, Tell no one about the vision until after the Son of Man has, be, has been risen from the dead. For the word of God, thanks be, thanks to, be God. to God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Holy love, may the words of my mouth, may the thoughts of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, and may they bring you glory. Amen. There are still, there are a lot of stories in the Bible, Hebrew and Christian testaments of people meeting God, the holy of holy, on the top of a mountain. What is it about mountains that creates this mystical space within the imagination of the human being? Does it harken back to smoking volcanoes, the grounds would shake, rushing wind through the peaks and crevices, the cracks and caves can sound like roaring whispers, voices, wet rock faces catching the light in a certain way, shimmering like fire. How many of us have seen that iconic photo from Yosemite National Park, or as Trump would say, Yosemite National Park. <coughs> when the horsetail falls, becomes firefall for just a brief moment. How many have seen that iconic picture? Hmm? You've, have you seen it in person? No? Look it up. Yosemite Falls fire, any of those word combinations, and you'll see the photos. And it's actually around this time of year, mid to late February, when the sun is in a certain position, and there's this cliff face, and it's horsetail fall, so it comes flying off the rocks. It's not just a trickle down. It comes flying off like a horsetail. And just for a brief moment where the sun is, it turns the color of the waterfall brilliant red. It looks like molten lava as it's coming off the mountain. It's breathtaking. To an ancient people, there must have been some divine hand or hands in the change from water to fire. To our scientific minds, we know it has everything to do with the placement of the sun on the horizon, but still, you know, even though we know what it, what it does, how it changes, we know all of these things, this moment is still breathtaking. And for the heart that is shaped by faith or a spiritual practice, though it be environmental science, it is still holy and amazing to see. How many of us, <coughs> maybe in our younger days, maybe we still do, we're part of a, a hiking group, or we liked to walk in the woods, or we like to... Uh, do such things, we'd march up to the top of a lookout, maybe uh, hike up a mountain, maybe climb a mountain. And on, those, on the first day um, that we hiked and walked and panted uh, 11 kilometers from uh, Yaktapata to Wayambamba, <laughs> when I w hiked the Inca Trail, we climbed from about 2,600 meters on that first day, that 11-kilometer hike, to 3,000 meters above sea level. And, and that was just the warm-up. <laughs> we would camp there the first night, and then day two, we would make our way over what was called Dead Woman's Pass. I was really hoping that wouldn't happen. We'd hike up to Dead Woman's Pass, covering eight kilometers up, from 3,000 meters to just over 4,200 meters, and then 
four kilometers back down to camp at 3,600 meters. And day three, it was a 16 kilometer up and then mostly down slog all the way to Winna, Winna at 2,700 meters to camp. And the last day, which was only a, s only a six kilometer hike into Machu Picchu up and over the steep steps of the Sun Gate, which was completely shrouded in early, shrouded in early morning mist and ending this epic adventure at 2,300 meters above sea level. And it was funny as I was writing this and thinking about climbing mountains and hiking mountains and wandering, when I finished my sermon this morning, I turned off, you know, you exit out of all of your screens and I just had my screensaver on and it rotates through. I have all these different pictures. I don't know if you set yours to just rotate through. <laughs> It was me at Machu Picchu with my arms outstretched and the iconic rock community behind me. I thought, oh, that's weird. I was just writing about you. When people would ask me why, why on earth would you not just take the train into Aguas Caliente, the village at the base of the mountain from which people can take a bus to the Incan ruins? I would say, well, why not? Now I can say I've done it. Because I always wanted to walk those paths where others have walked before to get to their spiritual center, hidden away and protected in the mountains. I was talking to some of you just the other day. Do you remember as we got a glimpse, we walked out the front doors of the church and Mount Elizabeth was sort of lit up and it was one of the few days we haven't had it all shrouded in clouds. And we all just paused in her glory. And I was told that it is completely doable to hike up to its peak. Yeah, have you done it? Have you hiked up there? Okay, okay, a few of you folks have hiked. Why did you do it? You wanted to try, because you could. Young. Was it young and dumb? <laughs> yes, peer pressure. Okay, all the real reasons of why we climb this mountain. It's totally doable to the peak, and if you are so inclined, it would take a full day to go up and back, and you'd best be in proper gear. Um, just in case the clouds roll in, because once the clouds roll in, you can see hardly anything up there. And climbing, climbing mountains is serious business. It's serious business when you have all the right gear and all the right training and you're fit. Imagine climbing up to a mountain without proper equipment, or like me, <laughs> totally not being <laughs> in shape to, to climb eight kilometers up a mountain. Imagine climbing up without all that equipment. So maybe that's why Moses took Joshua with him. <laughs> Joshua was there to carry the food and the shelter, enough for 40 days. <laughs> we climb as high as we can climb. We climb as high and as far as the trail will take us, and then it eventually, it usually ends at some amazing view site, and the world is at our feet. Do we remember those heady moments of hiking up a big hill or or if it's still our vibe, to, to hike somewhere and get that amazing view. Nowadays, we can just usually catch a gondola. Get the gondola to the top of the mountain. We get up there, and we maybe we feel a little closer to God, a little closer to heaven. We can touch the sun. We can touch the stars. They can touch us. There's no sound. Nothing but the wind whispering, roaring in our ears, the sound of our own heartbeats <laughs> thumping <laughs> from the exertion of getting to that point. Exhilarated and nervous, rejoicing and accomplishment, humbled by the grandeur and the beauty. Do we remember those moments? Moses, he disappears into the clouds, and after six days surrounded by vapor and mist, he calls out to, he's called out of the cloud and into the presence of God. And from the base of the mountain, looking up, people see only fire and smoke and clouds. Will Moses make it back? And when he does come back, not only is he carrying the tablets of rules to live by, rules to love by, he is also glowing. His face is shining. 
In fact, every time he has a conversation of God, people notice him change and it terrifies them. And so he has to cover his face every time until the glow subsides in the presence of the holy, some of that holy light lingers. Skip ahead some 1,500 years, give or take, and Jesus takes a few of his friends up a mountain. This isn't a new thing. Often Jesus went up a hillside, climbed a mountain to gain some perspective, to get away from the crowds. He'd go up to pray alone or take a few of his people with him. He'd take his students up to high places to teach. So when they agreed to follow along, they had no reason to think it would be any different than any other time that Jesus needed to get away and breathe and just pray a while. But it was different. He lit up. His clothes turned shimmering white. Suddenly, Elijah, the prophet of prophets, and Moses, the liberator and lawgiver, the representatives of the Hebrew Testament's books of the laws and the prophets, are there together with Jesus. And Jesus was the one person who, in the writer Matthew's mind, was bringing these two streams of Judaism, the prophetic teachings and the holiness codes and laws, together within himself. And Peter, Peter always makes me laugh, how he always tends to miss the point. So human and so earnest in wanting to help, faced with this amazing sight, says, Hey, Jesus, um, this, this is amazing. Let me throw some shelters together for the three of you, and we can just stay a while. Let me take care of our physical needs while y'all figure out how to fix the world. <laughs> And then it is written that suddenly the hilltop where they were gathered became cloaked in mist and a voice came from that mist saying, this is my son, the beloved, with him I am well pleased, listen to him. Everyone not directly engaged in a divine conversation, a sacred meeting of the hearts, hit the ground in fear. And when they dared to look up again, Moses and Elijah were gone and Jesus was back to his normal well, back to as normal as Jesus was ever normal, self. It was interesting to note during our Lenten, our lection reflection on Monday night, when we read all four of the passages generally assigned for the week from, from the uh, Psalms and the Epistle, the Christian and Hebrew Testaments, from the Revised Lectionary, although we didn't include it in our readings today, the epistle came from 2 Peter chapter 1. Believed to be a letter written by Peter, he is telling people about his experience on the mountaintop, as recorded by Matthew. In verse 17 and 18, Peter writes, For Jesus received honor and glory from God when that voice was conveyed to him by the majestic glory, saying, This is my Son, my beloved, in whom I am well pleased, we ourselves heard this voice come from heaven while we were with him on the holy mountain. Mm -hmm. Pretty much word for word, right? This is my son, my, the, beloved, with him, with whom I am well pleased. And this is Peter writing the letter, his first-hand account. He was there. This is what he heard. But isn't it interesting that he left out a pretty important piece of that encounter. Did you notice it? The one and only thing that God said for them to do. Listen to him. Yeah, yeah, God's child. Yeah, yeah, you love Jesus and you're pleased with how he's turning out, but the part about listening to him... Well, that can be left to interpretation. <laughs> Listen to him. That's it. Love one another as I have loved you. Forgive each other. Look out for each other. Help the one, help one another to heal. Be kind to children. Welcome them. Don't be a cause for them to stumble. Don't make it harder for the already vulnerable to uh, be humble. Be courageous and compassionate. Don't forget to thank God for all your blessings. It's easy. Listen to him. It's, it's that hard. <laughs> Listen to him. Finally, 
I just want to comment on the whole glowing personality thing. For those of us in the healing ministry here at First United, we talk about such things. Now, have you ever heard somebody or have you ever said in reference to a new couple in love, oh, look at them, they're just glowing. See how they lit up when so-and-so arrived? Or a pregnant woman, she's just glowing. This place just got a lot brighter. Or have you ever said about someone, oh, that one, you know, he or she is in their element. This is exactly what they were born to do. They are just shining. Sound familiar? You know what I think? I'll tell you what I think, because I can. I think Jesus was always glowing. He was always shining, and his light burned the eyes of the people who couldn't handle his energy. Literally and figuratively, his energy. I get a sense on Jesus' best days, he was just plugged into God, source of life and love. And on days when his internal battery was down below a certain percentage, he'd climb a mountain, he'd find a secluded beach or get in a boat, and he'd pray and he'd recharge full batteries, full bars. Some people saw him shine and were attracted to him like moths to a flame. And others, more accustomed to and comfortable with darkness, they would have to shield their eyes or yell, turn it off, it's just too dang bright, stop it. Somehow, some way, they would need to dim his light. Marianne Williamson's quote says it best, and I've used this before, and it's always a really good reminder. Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. It is our light, not our darkness, that most frightens us. We ask ourselves, who am I to be brilliant, gorgeous, talented, fabulous? Actually, who are you not to be? You are a child of God. Your playing small does not serve the world. There's nothing enlightened about shrinking so that other people won't feel insecure around you. We are all meant to shine as children do. We were born to make manifest the glory of God that is within us. It is just some of us. It is not just in some of us. It is in every one. And as we let our own light shine, we unconsciously give other people permission to do the same. As we are liberated from our own fear, our presence automatically liberates others. Jesus wasn't playing small. He was meant to shine. And this is it. If he was meant to shine, if that was just how and who he was, I am convinced that Jesus was not transfigured. I am saying this out loud and on camera. Jesus was who he always was and would be and always will be. A being of light. A human so connected to the ultimate source of life that he couldn't help but shimmer. And the thing about light, you can see it best when it's dark. You can see the stars best when it is night. I am convinced completely and totally that what was changed that day on that hilltop was not Jesus. It was Peter and James and John. Something in them that day shifted and they were gifted with the ability to see Jesus' real and complete physical and spiritual presence. Something opened up in them, not just their eyes. Something shifted inside of them that day that allowed them to see the light that was always there. But could they, would they ever see it in one another? Listen to him. The one thing they were told to do that they left out in the letter. He said to them as they lay face down on their bellies on that mountaintop, don't be afraid. Stand up. 
And when they stood up, he was no longer shining. When they stood up, was part of them still afraid, still overwhelmed? Could it be that their fear, the in their fear, the blinds were pulled shut once more and they couldn't see his true essence again? Do not be afraid. Stand up. Don't tell anybody what you saw today until it's time. But when you do share the story, don't forget about the part that God said. Listen to him. Okay? Thanks be to God. Amen. <laughs> was beautiful, Phelan. Now, I know one was our love colors outside the lines or my love colors. What was the other piece that you wove in there? I can sing a rainbow? I can sing a rainbow. Oh, it's such a pretty. I love how you weave. Don't you just love how she weaves things together? Beautiful. Let's pray. Holy One, thank you. 
Thank you for bringing us into this moment together. And we, we take a moment to even thank ourselves for making the choice to be here today. There are so many other things that tempt us and ask that are for our attention through the day, and it's just so good. It's so good that we choose to be present with one another and present with you and, and just to spend some time pondering our place in the universe and your place in our lives. We give thanks because we know, we know that we are so very blessed to be able to gather like this. There are people around this world who have to worship any faith, uh, that they just go and to, to, to be a person of faith of any shape or size is just dangerous and has to be hidden and it is just so good to be able to be with you and to be with our brothers and sisters in Christ and feel safe in doing so. And so we get this chance to be together and with intention we pray for our world. We pray we pray today for the people, especially on the North Island of New Zealand. There are so many still lost and animals and crops and uh, flooding due to the cyclone. We just pray. We give thanks for everyone on the ground who is helping in every way that they can. We continue to pray with the people of Ukraine we, tent, we continue to pray with the people in Russia who are calling for peace. We pray for the people in Iran who are protesting and calling for freedom. Holy One, we can make our way around this world to every single country, every single continent, even our own. And we pray that justice is still needed. Freedom from fears and conspiracies still needed. We pray for those who, whose own homes are a dangerous place. We pray for those who are seeking work, affordable living wages. We pray for those who are seeking safe, clean drinking water. We pray for our leaders that they choose, they choose to care for those who are most vulnerable. Holy One, in silence we lift up to you all those places and faces, those close to us and those far away who who are heavy in our hearts today. Those who are grieving. Those who are dealing with receiving a, a difficult prognosis. those who are choosing to let things go for their own state of mind and being and health. We lift up to you our own selves. We come before you with, with our joys and our woes, with our gratitudes and our need for grace. For all this, Holy One, we ask. For much more, we give thanks in the name of the Child of Light, the one who taught us to pray together the prayer that we sing now.
In the Hebrew Testament, they introduced the spiritual practice of gratitude and generosity. And it may seem odd for us to think of gratitude and generosity as a spiritual practice, but they are because it helps us make us more loving and courageous and gentle and humble. This ancient lesson for the collective soul of a people encouraged people to be thankful for the harvest, thankful for a place to call home, a people to call friends and family. Thank you. Thankful for all of our varied and valued blessings. And from our thankfulness, we practice generosity. And we are asked to give back to God 10% of what God gives to us, knowing that it is impossible to put a monetary value upon love and beauty, freedom, a sense of belonging, purpose, and grace. And from those collected gifts, given not out of obligation or resentment fr from genuine joy and thanksgiving, ministries of compassion and of justice, uh, justice seeking, of hospitality, accompaniment, and liberation were supported. And now we find ourselves 2,500 years later and the spiritual practice of generosity still allows us to bring Christ's light and redemption to the communities in which we serve. Kitimat's First United Church thanks you all for supporting local and global ministries with financial gifts, your prayers, and with your presence, because without your gifts, we wouldn't have this online ministry. Uh, we wouldn't be able to sing as church at Mountain View, which I think we are signed up to do. We're going to try again on the first Sunday in March at 2 o'clock. Uh, and we wouldn't be able to be here to provide funerals and weddings and baptisms. So without your gifts, be they 2, 5, or 10 percent, we wouldn't be here to let people know in no uncertain terms that they and we are all valued loved, worthy, welcomed, invited, and included, no matter our gender, our ethnicity, our age, our education, orientation, or past, or our past, present, or future. We wouldn't be able to be here to let people know God's love is for all, and that God is glad we are here in the world, that God so loved. We receive this offering with, with grateful joy. Your generosity revitalizes languages. This is a minute for mission. Take a moment to think about your favorite story. Now imagine that story at risk of disappearing because the language it's written in is endangered. This is something that nine elders from Haida Gwaii are passionately trying to change. Once there were over 15,000 fluent speakers of high of Haida, but today, because of assimilation tactics like residential schools, almost all Haida people speak English at home. The nine elders, with an average age of more than 80, represent about half of the fluent Haida speakers who remain. With partner support, the work of these elders in a research-based revitalization project keeps the Heisla language alive and growing. The elders are teaching students the words, phrases, songs, and stories of their ancestors. The response has been empowering, with language learn learners near and far dedicating themselves to study. Lessons are given through the longhouse of Skidigat village, but the program reaches much farther with more than 120 online lessons available. The opportunity to connect across the globe has allowed Haida language stories and culture to be shared broadly. The program also gives young people from the Haida nation the opportunity to collect, connect with the elders to nurture their cultural pride and understanding. I appreciate the work of the elders are doing with the language and culture, said one young student. They work very hard every day so that my generation can remember. The Haida language is not the only indigenous language that has been endangered. 
your gifts to mission and service, support programs and partnerships for Indigenous cultural revitalization around the world. God, your love is amazing, your peace transforming, your welcome complete. As we show our gratitude and our generous giving, we ask you to bless the gifts. Bless our time and our talents, our prayers and dreams, and please make something beautiful of them. Holy One, bless it all so we can be part of making a healing difference, a positive impact in the world around us, locally and globally. And we say, Amen. Amen. <coughs> And, and go have pancakes on Tuesday and go have ashes on Wednesday and on, on Saturday come for a walk 
And, and I just discovered where karaoke is in this town on Fridays, so if you want to come to karaoke on Friday with me, you're welcome to do that too. Go from this place remembering who you are and who we are together and to whom we belong. Let's move from this place with a deep awareness of God's presence in our lives, God's will for our lives in the world. Let's go from this place with gratitude in our hearts, love in our eyes, peace in our words, and healing in our hands. Go from here intent on sharing these gifts, this sacred wisdom, these spiritual gifts given to us in order to help make the world a better, more compassionate place. And go knowing we are not alone. We walk with God, Christ, and the Holy Spirit with nothing to fear, because we are never alone. Thanks be to God. And the people say, Amen. Amen.